Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to our Virtual Connect series. We have a timely conversation today um, in the midst of some weather change, if not climate change. Uh, when you have a 60 degree variation in a 24 hour period, it makes for some interesting conversation. And uh, we were just sharing before starting the call with our colleagues from Washington, D.C., how crazy it's been here lately. Um, so we're going to talk about stewardship of the planet and making sure we have a livable place for us to practice in and live in here in Colorado. Uh, this session today has been submitted for HSW credit with National and it's pending approval. So once that does get approved, you'll receive credit with HSW for attending today's session. Uh, this presentation is a follow-up to what we have done earlier in the year. Uh, you may remember, for those of you who saw it, our State of the Association address, which we hosted in July. In case you haven't seen that and are interested, you can check it out on our YouTube page. Uh, we have a channel there and um, it was very well received, but we gave an overview of where the organization is going and where we want members to help come with us uh, in the initiatives that we want to pursue. Uh, and we identified three organizational imperatives that our, our board has said that we're going to work on. And one of them is environmental stewardship. So you're hearing more about that today as a single subject um, focused presentation. I'm going to hand it off to a number of presenters today to provide you with those perspectives on this imperative. And we're going to start with summarizing our efforts um, by national. We're looking to precedence in these imperatives of people who are already far ahead of, of the game in this. Uh, and fortunately, we have that in each and every case. So we're going to first hear from national and what they're doing, um, explore efforts by our own sustainability working group that's here in AI Colorado, made up of member volunteers. And we conclude with a presentation by a local practitioner who is already doing this work and can make the case for how it's made a difference in their firm and their practice and how others can do it as well. As always, we ask you to use the Q&A function uh, as you think of a question, um, or if you wanna wait until the end to ask it, that's fine based on the dialogue. In any case, we're gonna be monitoring those and getting to them as soon as our presenters wrap up their, their portion of the program. So without further ado, I'd first like to welcome Adam Harding, our AI Colorado board president this year, who will provide a welcome on his part and an overview for what it means to have this as an organizational imperative. Welcome, Adam. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for everyone taking the time today. Uh, yes, yeah, so as Mike said, the board has been working hard this year to really define who we are and where we need to be going in the future. And environmental stewardship is one of the imperatives that we uh, is important. Um, National has said that they are coming out with the big move in environmental stewardship. And so we wanted to align where we could at the state level with National. It's, it's great that National is going to be putting the effort in and giving us the toolbox and the, um, I guess, means and methods and, and, and helping us do this. But without the state components and the local sections and the members really buying into this and saying that this is important to us, uh, it's hard to get traction and it's hard to row in the same direction. And so at the state, we want to say this is important and we hope this, this is important to all of you. Um, as you know, Mike said, it was uh, 100 degrees one day and snowing yesterday. And so things are a little crazy in the world right now. So we need to do our part as stewards for the environment with the work that we do and row in the same direction to make some traction and get things done in the right direction. So uh, that's why we set this imperative and we hope that you will all join us in this effort. Um, so thank you, Mike. Thanks, Adam, uh, for sharing that and um, kind of setting the stage for a while we're even talking about this today. Um, so we're going to move there from sort of the board introduction of what, what makes it an imperative and why it's important to uh, start introducing more of those uh, friendly faces you saw at the top of the hour and the beginning of the ses session. Um, so like we said, on each of these imperatives, uh, we have a precedent that we can draw from that, that provides a model and a path forward. And I, I think to their credit, National has been um, far ahead on this, on this um, issue and initiative. And we started hearing about it, um, you know, years ago as they started describing it as the big move, the lens through which everything is, is measured and, and evaluated as an organizational priority 
from the national level on down. So if national, like Adam said, is the only one that, work, that works on it, it's not gonna make as much of a difference. So we wanna hear what national is doing and what better way to do that than to hear from them themselves. So I'm gonna ask Melissa and April to come on now. We'll start with an introduction of Melissa. Melissa Morency, a Associate AIA, is the Director of Sustainable Knowledge and Engagement for the American Institute of Architects. She came to AIA after seven years of practice in architecture and now works to advance the knowledge and adoption of sustainability issues within the architecture industry. She's a staff lead for the Framework for Design Excellence and Associated Collateral, including the Top 10 Toolkit. Melissa works on our sustainability knowledge resources and leads efforts in engaging local AI components around sustainability. That's the reason we're talking to her today. Melissa holds a professional Bachelor of Architecture from Syracuse University. And thank you, Melissa. It's great to have you here. Next, we have April Evans, who's a specialist at AI National for the Sustainability, Resilience, and Disaster Assistance Teams. She holds a degree in sustainability from the University of Tennessee and made her way to DC to work first in green venture capital before coming to AIA. April's the program manager for the safety assessment program. She also works on the development of sustainable resources, education, outreach to members and components. Uh, welcome to you as well, April, and thanks for joining us. Um, ladies, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you guys so much for having us. Um, April and I are happy to reach out to our components and um, definitely are always excited to coordinate and um, I think it's great what you all are talking about in that um, shared effort uh, will definitely get us further faster. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit on the uh, what we're calling the road to excellence. So kind of how we got here, what is the big move and and what are our goals here at National. So some of the key points um, leading up to the big move at AIA. Um, in 2018, AI adopted a revised ethical standard for practice. So I'm not sure how many are aware that we do have um, a standard for ethics um, within AIA and what we expect all of our members to abide by. And in 2018, there were changes made to that that include um, increased standards around sustainability and resilience and what we think architects' responsibilities around those are. Um, that led to, um, in 2019, in February, the board announced a big move towards environmental stewardship. The board decided that was a goal that they really wanted all of AIA to get behind. So rather than a million disparate tasks and, and um, initiatives, we really wanted to put a lot more time and energy behind one effort um, and having a lot more of AI supporting this one area. So in June of 2019, there was a resolution at the AI conference that um, was for urgent and sustained climate action. And so this had a series of additional uh, resources and, and climate um, imperatives, including a climate action plan and, and other initiatives that um, they wanted us to pass. And so that was a member initiative. Um, and so that was ratified by the board in September of 2019. So what we really had was the board saying it was a priority, the membership saying it was a priority, and then us as staff after the resolution was ratified in September, really getting a lot more support in, in um, creating these initiatives and, and support documents um, to show that it isn't true, truly a, um, priority. So in uh, that ratification, uh, AI adopted the Code Top 10 uh, framework as the framework for design excellence. Um, in April of 2020, the board approved a climate action plan um, that a group of members uh, worked on with staff to kind of set forth um, some priorities and potential projects and, and paths is to Kind of support our climate action goals. Um, and then in June of 2020, we um, were, the board approved the revisions to the framework for design excellence. So we did say that the, the framework for design excellence was important to AIA, um, but since it did come out of the Coke Top 10 Awards project, um, it was very awards based. And so we wanted to turn it into more of a design tool than um, an awards 
kind of, I guess it was more of a destination rather than a process. So the framework for design excellence, um, as it's been revised, uh, it's the mission of the framework is um, the framework represents the defining principles of good design in the 21st century, comprised of a series of 10 value statements and accompanied by searching questions, it informs progress towards a zero carbon, equitable, resilient and healthy built environment. It is intended to be accessible and relevant for every architect, every client, and every project, and every project regardless of size, typology, and, or aspiration. So this is a project I worked on this year with a group of um, task members, uh, or task group of members from across the US. Um, we worked with focus groups around, I think, four different components and over 70 to 80 different members um, sharing their thoughts on um, the Coat Top 10 to influence what we kind of came up with in the adjustments to the framework. We, the task group thought it was really important, um, especially from the feedback we, feedback we received, to make sure that it was accessible and relevant to everyone and that this isn't something that other people are doing. This isn't something that is intangible. This isn't something that is only used in special occasions, that the framework, the way they had made the adjustments, it should be able to be used in all instances and all projects. So here are our 10 principles um, for design excellence. And I am gonna go through. Um, so the overall layout, and I'm not gonna read all 10 to everybody, um, but the overall layout is that there is a title for every, every principle, a mission statement um, on what we're trying to accomplish, and then at the bottom in the italics, you can see the series of probing questions that we think you can ask at the beginning of the design process to sort of lead you to a better uh, project, um, something that will lead you to good design or design excellence. So our 10 principles are design for integration, Design for equitable communities. Design for ecosystems. Design for water. Design for economy. Design for energy. Design for well being. Design for resources. Design for change and design for discovery. A lot of these topic areas are very similar to what they were before. Um, there have been a few adjustments in the overall title. So. so if you want to find the overall framework for design excellence along with those um, questions and mission statements, you can go to the little uh, web address at the bottom of this page at ai.org forward slash design excellence with capital B and capital E, um, and you will be able to find the Framework for Design Excellence, a downloadable PDF that you will be able to take to client meetings or to um, project charrettes, as well as the toolkit that will help support the Framework for Design Excellence. So it is one thing to ask questions um, and have thoughtful discussion with our clients and our, and our fellow architects about um, design excellence, but how do we accomplish these things? Where are the resources that help us design for equitable communities? And that is also on this web page. It is a part of our toolkit um, that we are currently uh, currently um, revisiting right now uh, to make sure that it matches some of those adjustments we've made in the framework and just to make sure that some of those resources are up to date and no links are broken or uh, maybe there's a new resource that isn't currently represented there. Um, but this, this toolkit will help um, address these kind of values and, and these missions um, and help find best practices. What are the most important things to address? The high impact strategies, which we call if you can only do one thing. So if you've never really looked at designing design for equitable communities, um, 
what are what is the one thing you can do in that area to start out with that is going to have the biggest impact um, in the shortest amount of time? Uh, we also have the curated web resources. So this is a long list of of what we have determined to be the best resources. So it's not the longest list. It's not going to go on forever, but um, to help you accomplish these tasks. So it might link out to the 2030 palette or um, some resources from DOE or the EPA. And then we have case studies. So these are former Code Top 10 award recipient projects that really exemplify that principle. Um, and so if you are really wondering how another firm or another project did equitable communities well, um, you can find some examples uh, by clicking on the case studies tab. So those are the things that we are currently looking to update, but are really great resources to help accomplish these tasks, even as is right now. Um, and, and so hopefully you can use those to help you accomplish or, or this design excellence in your projects. So as I said, um, the next steps for the framework, as we move forward, we are editing the toolkit to reflect the updates. Um, we are also working on a climate action practice guide that will align with our framework for design excellence as well as our climate action plan. And so this is going to help. Um, so the framework for design excellence is how you practice good architecture, how you design excellent uh, projects in, in the era of climate change. The toolkit is how you accomplish those goals and the climate action practice that is how you practice that way. So how do you look at your firm and the way and your firm culture to address climate action and also practice what you preach? So not only designing um, to address climate action, but practicing um, and your firm uh, and how you run it to also um, address climate action and make sure that you are um, in alignment with what we say our goals are in the, in the architecture we create. We are also creating education on AIU um, for each of the 10 principles of the framework for design excellence. And the first is equitable communities, and that should be out later this fall. And then we're doing things like this. We're sharing this information with our members, our, component, our components, as well as committees, um, and looking for additional ways to implement it and, and share it um, with all of our members and hopefully our members will start to integrate um, the framework into their practice and everyday lives. Thank you, Melissa. So as Mike introduced, um, I'm April and education and resources for our team is very much my realm of expertise. Um, and we're introducing ourselves as being from the sustainability team because we are, but in addition to sustainability, we also have a lot of resources that pertain to resilience and disaster assistance. So if ever that comes into the purview of um, AI Colorado's member work, we also touch on those topic areas as well. It just kind of gets shuffled under our sustainability title. So talking first, um, we have a variety of options of education series that you can take um, both as members and then later on we'll be offering them for components to offer to their members in group viewings. Um, these are over 40 hours of CEUs. And I know a lot of people are still sitting at home in like a telework situation. So it's still a really good time to go through these materials and to really uh, get yourself familiar um, with everything. If you're not, they're a great place for people who are experienced, who are mid-level, but they're also great for people who need an introduction. So we have four online series, including the AI plus 2030, which talks about the 2030 commitment, um, how you get involved, what their goal is, and ultimately the strategies for achieving that goal. We also have the Materials Matter Certificate Program, which looks at material selection and materials transparency and how important that is to the design process and for architects themselves to consider. We have the Resilience and Adaptation series, which covers exactly what it sounds like. It's looking at how you can look at mitigation, resilience, adaptation, and best practices for managing your projects and buildings and communities when they might have to face disaster and shocks and stresses. And most recently, we have our Designing for Health series, um, which gets architects and public health officials in the same conversation to guide you through how architects can really rethink the design process to create healthier buildings. And in addition to these online versions or online courses, we also offer two in-person education series. One is an expanded version of the Materials Matter course series. It's 
five four hour courses that are offered through a component with subject matter experts. It's like a whole day thing. Unfortunately, we can't offer that right now because of COVID-19. Um, but if there's a way that we can adapt it so we can still do it online, we would love to. The material is not quite one-to-one, -one, but it is still worth your while to take that online course series. We also have the Post-Disaster Safety Assessment Program training, which IPM, and that teaches architects, engineers, and building officials how they can respond post-disaster to help their communities uh, get people safely back into buildings and structures. So we are piloting a virtual version of that. We can't promise that it's going to be something we continue to offer, um, and it is very limited in scope right now, but we're, we're feeling that out. Additionally, we also have over 30 resources, and initially they are kind of spanning very specifically health, energy, materials, and resilience, but just in the same way that we want our components and we want our members and we want our firms to really break into the principles of that framework, we're also adjusting our work in that direction too. So you might see that we're a little narrowed right now, but we're going to very quickly expand into other things because we wanna make sure that while we want you to be well-rounded, we wanna be offering well-rounded information as well. So the sort of resources we have out there are white papers, practice guides, we have our awards programs, we have content briefs, occasionally we also have webinars, and you can find all of these generally for free and available for download on ai.org forward slash sustainability. Um, and just instead of being like, we have lots of many things that you can look at and they're great, I wanted to kind of walk you guys through and spotlight uh, three of the ones that we added this year. Um, even amidst COVID-19, we were able to get content out. So this first one, which was timely, um, is the Architect's Guide to Business Continuity. So in addition to pandemics, floods, cyber attacks, um, maybe someone way up high in the firm leaving the firm, um, all of these things can stop an architecture's business. Um, and how do you remain profitable? How do you stay open? How do you walk through that? How do you plan for that? So this guide offers a, um, a way for firms to understand the elements of a business continuity plan how to create one, assess your risks, um, and identify actions that reduce your firm's vulnerability and minimize disruption. And again, this was planned pre-COVID-19, and it just happens to really fit the, the era that we're in now. This next one was directly from COVID-19. Um, we had a lot of people work really quickly on this, but this is AI Reopening America and its strategies for buildings, for safer buildings. So we got together a bunch of architects, um, a bunch of public health officials, facility managers, engineers, and we put them all into a same virtual room. And we're like, how can we make better buildings? So this whole initiative um, was looking at reducing the spread of pathogens, not just COVID-19, um, accommodating, accommodating physical distancing and fulfilling alternative operational uh, facilities capacities. So from all of those charrettes and all of that work, we came up with a slew of resources, including a risk management plan, a reoccupancy assessment tool, a COVID-19 arc map, and also white papers um, for strategies that individually address how to open safer offices, schools, retail, senior living facilities, and multi-family uh, housing. And all of those are at a different link. Um, it's ai.org forward slash safer buildings. And for something not completely different, um, but a little off the disaster and resilience path, we also put out the Design for Adaptability, Deconstruction and Reuse Guide. Um, but as with many of the things that we've done, we also found that it was still relevant. Um, good architecture should be able to last and it should be able to withstand change and wear and tear. Um, but we're finding that there are millions of tons of debris from construction and deconstruction waste that's happening in the US right now. So this guide is a practice guide and it looks and how architects can design their buildings to last, um, to be able to adapt and be reused and deconstructed in the way that is most sustainable. And you can also find that on our website. So I am gonna circle back to one of AI's flagship programs, the AI 2030 Commitment. As many of you are probably aware of our AI 2030 commitment, I'm just going to give a little high level overview. Um, so the mission of the AI 2030 commitment is to transform practice, um, the practice of architecture in a way that is holistic, firm wide, project based and data driven. So participants are supposed to prioritize energy performance um, as they work towards carbon neutral buildings. 
developments and major renovations by 2030. So this is in alignment with Architecture 2030's 2030 Challenge. Um, and as you can see, these uh, key dates of, of the reductions, <laughs> our reduction goals, um, as we move forward. Uh, and so we are currently in 2020, which an 80% reduction over base, from baseline, um, with hopefully being carbon neutral by 2030. So 2030, um, so some key notes on 2030 signatories. Um, they are considered leaders in the profession. So seven out of the 10 most recent AI architecture firm award recipients are 2030 signatories. Um, the second note I actually have questions with back to our team about, um, it says that since its inception in 1997, every firm to receive a co top 10 award has been a 2030 signatory. Um, so I, I'm going to go back and, and validate that. But currently, you have to be a 2030 signatory to submit for or be considered for a Coat Top 10 award. And that has been true for, I believe, at least four years. So you cannot win a Coat Top 10 award if you are not a 2030 signatory. Um, and then in 2018, more than 70% of AI award winning projects were designed by one or more 2030 signatory firms. And so that is not just Coat Top 10, that is all AI awards programs, architecture, interiors, um, and, and everything else. So leaders and winner, uh, architect firm award winners uh, are all 2030 signatory firms. Sorry, I went backwards. Um, so benefits for 2030 signatory terms. Um, so be the master of your own data. 2030 signatories are able to track and report basic data through our free and confidential cloud-based tool, the AI Design Data Exchange. This tool works with others in your toolbox to help you stay on top of your portfolio performance, identify low-performing buildings, and learn from your high-performing buildings. Use this data to make presentations to staff and clients. And so, it is, it is beyond just trying to meet our 2030 commitment goals. These, this is, these are additional ways where I, being a participant can help you and your firm um, be that high performing firm that you hope to be. Um, so get recognized, 2030 commitment signatories are more likely to report wins in design awards. As more and more awards programs adopt the framework for design excellence and require performance statistics and award applications, we expect those numbers to increase. For another perspective, consider this, seven out of the 10 last uh, architecture firm award recipients are signatories. Uh, attract clients and talent. AI firms sustainability and values influence 68% of potential employee choice. And for just over one third, they are a deciding factor. So you can recruit better, um, better talent, uh, better employees for your firm, um, as that is a decision-making factor in uh, young professionals deciding where they want to work. Um, being a part of the 2030 commitment is a way to signal your values and set yourself apart from other firms. So here is just the first 36 months in um, how you would be a part of the 2030 commitment. So the first step is the most simple step to sign the commitment letter. Um, you just have to get your leadership and your firm to sign the letter and say that this is something that they want to pursue. The second step is creating a sustainability action plan. That is talking about how your firm is going to practice a more sustainable architecture. How are you going to operate in a more sustainable manner? The third step is trying to meet 2030 targets. And I want to emphasize the word trying here. We are not nailing the 2030 targets, unfortunately, across the board in architecture firms, but we at least have to try. We need to have that high level goal of something that we are trying to meet. Um, and so we have to be able to track it and, and, and attempt to meet that, um, that effort. Number four, report all the projects in the DDX. So this is something you can do along the design process. Um, the DDX was built, so you do not have to report all of your projects at the end of the year, like our old process, but that as you work through projects, you can put them in the DDX and continue to track your progress over the course of the design process. 
Um, and number five is update and review your sustainability action plan regularly. So your sustainability action plan isn't something that should stay stagnant. It's something that should change over time as you all progress and as you become more sustainable in your in your firm and, and how you can continue to um, do better. So this is one of my favorite resources. Um, there are so many times that we hear that people are scared of the 2030 commitment. Um, you know, and on the left we have the myth. It takes too much time. It requires too many resources. Um, the, the fear of not performing well, I don't want to, I don't want to track it because I don't want to know. Um, as if uh, not looking into it makes it untrue. Um, the idea that you have to achieve the 2030 targets to participate. Um, and that the projects must be completed. So projects uh, that are never completed can be put into the design data exchange because it is about the design process and what you are trying to accomplish. The project does not have to be completed. Um, you know, it's typical time to gather and input data for a project is less than 30 minutes. The, the design data exchange is free um, and it offers a variety of resources and support for you. Uh, all of the aggregated data is anonymous. So if you are not meeting your goals, that is okay. You will be the only one that knows that. Uh, other firms do not get to know what your performance is. So it is something that you can use to make sure your firm performs better and you can figure out why you're not. But you are not going to be dinged by uh, the overall profession for, for not meeting the goals. Um, and it allows you to track your own progress. So making progress is really the goal here. And if you aren't, you can't, you can't um, track your progress if you're not inputting it. So if you don't even see what your energy use is, then there's no way to do better in, in the long run. So that is all we have. Thank you. Thanks, April and Melissa. Appreciate that overview from National and um, I'm especially interested in the picture, April, that you shared with the safety assessment protocol, um, because I took that photo uh, years ago. So I'll let it slide that there's no photo credit on there. You got my permission to use it as much as you want. Um, Great, well, I was gonna grab it, but now I guess I'll just continue to not credit you. <laughs> yeah, have at it. Um, so we're gonna transition now from going from what's happening at national to bringing it home to what's going on here in Colorado at the state and local level. And who better do that than Brad Bull. So Brad, uh, for those who don't know, is one of our co-chairs of our sustainability working group. And yeah, Colorado's had a number of different committees and task forces over the years, um, uh, especially more recently, either a committee on the environment or, or, a, or a 2030 team or something along those lines. And we really wanted to transition that to a year where we throw everything in the bucket around sustainability and environmental stewardship and come up with a plan to go forward. So Brad's here today with over 30 years experience in design and construction industries. He's a graduate of the senior Denver master's program in architecture and landscape architecture and is a senior architect with AECOM. Brad has experience on a wide range of project types with a focus on the hospitality and mixed use markets. His passions for resilience, biophilia, and accessibility design provide value to a wide range of project opportunities. And he's worked with AIA for a, a lot of ways over the years uh, with the AI Colorado Board, and as I said, currently co-chair of the Sustainability Working Group. So Brad, tell us what's happening and what members can expect to see more of from the organization. Sure, well, thank you, Mike. Um, as Mike said, this is not a new group. Um, it's just been kind of rebranded a few times. Um, I should give a shout out to my co-chair, Deborah Lucking, uh, who's done a great job, and also uh, Nick Remus, who um, keeps everything in line and uh, hers the cat. So those two uh, are very important players in this whole conversation. Um, the Sustainability Advancement Working Group is our name now. Um, as Mike mentioned, it has gone under coat. Um, and apparently uh, that name wasn't sustainable. Uh, and then we were the Resiliency Advocacy Group, um, but now it's all about uh, sustainability. So um, we, uh, I think architects have a responsibility to be as resourceful as possible in confronting um, what I think is one of the greatest challenges of our era. Um, and so I'll give you a little overview of the why. Um, I think it's no surprise to people in Colorado that um, you know we think of 
the uh, outdoors is our greatest asset here and um, people have an appreciation for that and a day like today when uh, it's snowing in the September it's uh, just a realization that um, climate change is a real thing um, and there is a lot that architects can do about it so there's good news bad news um, and uh, I'll get into some of the hows in a little bit but um, in terms of the whys um, I think uh, we've seen some good background on that um, this is where we are today. Um, this is just neutral science. This is from NOAA. Um, their website has a lot of fun uh, applications and programs you can play with, um, but this just compares um, what's going on um, today. So you can see the global average temperature rising, um, which is a direct result of um, carbon dioxide uh, and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, you can play with the, the different tabs down below. I went with the sea level um, because you can see that rise and how that threats a lot of the built environment. Um, but these numbers are all interrelated. Um, and you'll see if I can. So that's uh, where we are. This is where we could go. Um, and this is from the uh, Paris Agreement um, website, um, which uh, not to get political, but our current administration has pulled out of that agreement. Um, the challenging group has uh, committed to rejoining that. So you can use that information if you'd like. Um, but you can see in 2020, we're at a crossroads. Um, you know, depending on, and these, all these little lines uh, represent different models of where we can go from here. Um, nobody knows exactly where it is, but um, based on um, greenhouse gas emissions, how we um, grow as populations and communities and how we design, um, there's a wide range of potential outcomes. So this is both the good news and the bad news. Um, if we don't change anything, um, it'll get pretty warm pretty quickly. Um, and that's what the goal of the Paris Agreement is, um, is to keep things under a 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, temperature average. Um, and uh, because that's really a trigger point when a lot of environmental um, catastrophes uh, kick in. Um, and so uh, in sort of the bad news department, no um, matter what, we're heading down a warmer road. Um, uh, with the, the graph on the right shows the probabilities of what the different paths translate to in terms of how the um, environment heats up uh, in Celsius. And um, just for you know, frame of reference, at two degrees Celsius, uh, the oceans will be in a pretty rough shape. There'll be no living corals, um, you know, fish species, all that kind of stuff. So, there's just so much doom and gloom, but I know there's a lot of studies about how uh, that is off-putting. So I'm not gonna go there, but I just want you to appreciate um, that we do have an opportunity um, to do things better. Um, the greenhouse gas emissions um, is uh, something that is in our control. As um, you can see there, the, the building sector um, is responsible for about 40% of the total global greenhouse gas emissions. So that's empowering. Um, you can see that the uh, new construction is um, a significant slice, as well as building operations. And I think programs like LEED done a good job in terms of um, changing the industry and improving um, how we um, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, but um, it's all very important. Um, and as previously mentioned with the 2030 challenge, um, the, this was started in 2002. Ed Mazaria, who is a, uh, now a fellow in the AIA, um, promote promoted this uh, challenge as a way to um, you know, slow down the uh, global temperatures, um, especially through the building sector. Uh, and when he proposed that, it seemed like uh, pretty far off, but um, you know, we're getting closer and uh, the targets are a challenge. Uh, but you know, hopefully that last graph showed that it's not a binary thing. We're not gonna either make it or not make it. It's just a function of how well uh, we do what we can to reduce the um, rising global temperatures. Um, a couple of things about Colorado. Um, you know, this is where we have our biggest opportunity is to work in this realm. Um, and uh, let's see if I can get to the, uh, oh yeah, the framework for design excellence. This is where, um, well, to back up one, sorry, the, uh, the 2030 challenge is uh, based by Architecture 2030. The AIA has um, promoted the 2030 commitment um, which you saw previously in terms of uh, agreeing to doing it and then reporting it and um, steering your projects towards better results. Um, we have uh, 39 firms in Colorado who have joined um, since 2009. Um, 
Uh, and that's a little depressing. Again, I think as Coloradans, we like to think we're smarter and have uh, more dialed in awareness of what's going on in the, um, the, the planet. And uh, so I think we can definitely improve in that regard. Um, there are 1,200 firms nationally that have joined the 2030 commitment. Um, and so Colorado has a small but um, still measurable impact on all that. Um, and so I encourage you to research that. That's part of what we do as a group. Um, we spend a lot of time in our different sessions going over how to uh, meet the 2030 challenge and its re reporting requirements. And um, yeah, so that's, that's one of the things we're aligning our, all of our educational programs towards things with um, AI um, concepts and imperatives. And um, so we think the group adds a lot of value uh, to people who want to understand what it really means <clears throat> to make that 2030 commitment. Um, the framework for design excellence, again, this is um, evolution of the Coat Top 10 um, Design Awards, which has been a great um, series that the AI has done out in terms of um, promoting education. Um, these are things that everybody can do on different projects. It's, uh, you know, there are opportunities that, um, you know, your program, your projects don't have to um, follow, you know, prescribed programs like LEAD or, um, you know, there's a zillion out there. Um, although Colorado did rank number one uh, last year in percentage of uh, lead buildings, so good job, Colorado. But um, these things, these 10 principles, um, you know, look on the website, research how they can apply to you um, and how you can do things better um, because they're very thoughtful. Um, they're based on, you know, collected information from lots and lots of projects. And so I highly encourage people who are interested in um, either taking a deep dive or dipping their toe in the water that these are all opportunities for um, how we can do things better. Um, again, a lot of our uh, group spends time um, discussing how we can be more uh, beneficial in terms of promoting our education um, so that architects can you know, educate ourselves first and then um, educate those we work with, whether it's clients or contractors or consultants. Um, we feel like that responsibility is on us um, to make that difference. Um, so we've had a series of uh, continuing education sessions that have um, focused around these different AI imperatives. Um, we started with um, an overview of the 2030 commitment. Um, we looked at some uh, net zero energy designs and um, what net zero means on different levels, especially in Colorado with water and um, energy and waste and how um, architects can do that more thoughtfully. We looked at some mass timber um, we uh, had a great advocacy overlap with the um, uh, state senator Chris Hansen, um, talked about legislative um, project progress in terms of reducing carbon emissions. Um, it was a great panel uh, moderated by the AIA and I think that was really thoughtful. Um, shout out to Paul Hutton who's coming up soon, um, but he was on that and I think that was a, a great um, uh, session. Um, we had other uh, topics about precast, um, net zero energy districts. Um, and looking ahead, we have um, the AI uh, virtual conference this year is October 14th through 16th. And on that Thursday, the 15th, um, that's a focus on um, just planet and how um, there's gonna be some great keynote speakers and panel discussions regarding sustainability, resilience, um, and how we can all raise our game in that regard. So um, hopefully that gives you uh, an overview of what we've been doing. Again, it's a pretty lively group. Um, there's uh, frustrations, you know, it's like 2030 challenge we spent a fair amount of time on and, you know, why are we not further along? But um, I sort of take the approach that the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago and the second best time is today. So um, for people who are just kind of getting into this, um, there's no time like the present and um, hopefully this um, group can help provide you with some uh, resources. And, you know, as you see the AIA has gotten um, a lot of just really thoughtful uh, material and resources online as well. Um, we meet, um, our next meeting is September 24th at 8 a.m. Um, again, you're guaranteed some good discussion. Um, and it's just for like-minded people and people who want to learn. And, you know, everybody's on a sort of a different path uh, in terms of their own education. And um, we just feel that this group is really useful in terms of advancing that um, for the architecture community. So with that, I uh, think that's my last slide. Yeah. Well, thanks, Brad, for representing the working group and, and for all the all the good stuff you've done so far this year, and, and obviously more to come. 
Um, you can find that meeting information on our website under the calendar page. And if you decide you'd like to be more than just a, a passing participant in those meetings, we have a call for volunteers that goes out at the end of the year for all of our committees, including this one. So um, if this is something that really interests you, we'd love to have you participate. So uh, we're coming to the point now, yeah, I, there was an intentional progression here. We're going from the board uh, articulating what the profession's values are um, to national learning about their plans and programs to our state and local committee leaders uh, talking about how we adapt those plans and programs and get engagement at the organizational level here where we all live and work. And now we're going, going to go into the practice perspective. So how does a practice implement these ideas? And let's look at somebody who's already done it and learn their successes and challenges along the way. And for that, we've got Paul Hutton. So I'll invite Paul to join us. All right, got unmuted. Here we go. And uh, my video started. All right, so while Paul's getting uh, the presentation queued up, um, just a little bit about Paul Hutton, FAIA and lead fellow. He is the Chief Sustainability Officer at Cunningham Group Architecture. He's dedicated his 40-year career to the integration of sustainability and design excellence. In addition to his duties at the firm, he's been active in many roles with the AIA, served as a judge in the Department of Energy Solar Decathlon Program, administered the Governor's Energy Office High Performance Building Program, moderated, moderated the 2030 Challenge Professional Series, and taught at the University of Colorado Architecture School for nearly two decades. He lives on a nearly net zero energy ranch south of Denver with his wife, dog, and free range chickens. Um, and it looks a little bit snowy there today at the ranch. That is so, what it looks like. All right. Thanks, Mike. Uh, how well, about thanks for joining us. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. How about if I start uh, doing a little sharing of the screen? All right. So um, I was asked just to take a few minutes and share a little bit about um, what we've been doing at Cunningham Group, but in order to do that, I need to back up just a little bit and share a few things uh, about the 22 years when I had my own small firm largely focused on sustainability design. So uh, let me go ahead and get started. So of course, I am Chief Sustainability Officer at Cunningham Group, and we have six U.S. offices and two overseas offices. So in my role, I get to be involved in work in all of those locations and across our many different uh, studios that we have in the firm. So let's go ahead. So I was asked to describe a little bit about, well, how did I get started in this journey? And for me, it's relatively straightforward to answer that. It all had to do with when I was in school and when I was starting to formulate ideas about what I wanted to do. And I had the good fortune to come upon this little book when I was in high school. It's called The Limits to Growth. Hopefully most of you have heard about it. I think it's one of the most tremendously influential books that few people have heard of, of all time. And, and by the time I finished reading that book in high school, it completely changed my ideas about what I wanted to do with my life and my career. And it sent me down this path of thinking about sustainable design. Uh, one of the amazing things about that book, if you go back and look at it now, published in 1972, was how accurate so many of those predictions were in the models that they had generated. Just to give you one example, they predicted that CO2 parts per million in the atmosphere at the year 2000 would be 380. Well, they were only off by 10 parts per million, incredibly uh, profoundly insightful in that book. So that got me started on that. Other things that happened in the 70s, of course, we started to get these first images, the blue marble images, they were called, of planet Earth, which really started to crystallize for people a different attitude about how we should be treating the planet we live on. And finally, in the 70s, we had things like the Carter administration uh, putting solar panels on the roof of the White House. So it just seemed as I was finishing my education and starting my career in the 70s, that sustainability was the only way to go, and it was going to be here right away. I had no idea how many twists and turns and frustrations would actually happen in my sustainable design career along the way. But uh, still glad I went ahead and, and proceeded with it. So, hey Paul, sorry, I, to, sorry to interject here, but I, we haven't been catching your screen. Um, oh, you had some images to share. Okay. I thought I was sharing. So let me try it again. Are you seeing my screen now? There we go. Okay, we got it. I'll back up one just so you can see. That, that's, the, that's the image that I was sharing with you. So there's the limits to growth, the blue marble earth, and good old Jimmy Carter. That, thanks for letting me know about that. So I moved to Denver, Colorado in 1980 specifically to work on active and passive solar architecture. That's what I wanted to do. 
And of course, that's what we called it back then. We weren't, didn't start using the word sustainability or sustainable design until well into the late 90s. So it was solar architecture, solar design. And that's what I ended up doing. I worked on a lot of projects that had large rooftop solar arrays. Of course, when we talked about solar arrays back then, they weren't PV panels, right? They were these other antique things. They were active heating solar panels with copper tubes behind glass plates. I don't know if you, any of you remember those, but, but I actually worked on designing a lot of those buildings. All of those solar panels now have been decommissioned and ended up uh, in the landfill. But by the mid 80s, uh, we figured out as a profession, and I certainly understood as an architect, that wasn't the way to go. That, that all of that was, was a little bit wasteful. And we started focusing on more fundamental principles of design that you see here in this building that I designed as a fairly young architect. Uh, and it was all about daylighting and better envelopes. And we started to really reconnect to what would make a high performance building. In fact, this was one of the first schools in Colorado to be 100% daylighted since the 1950s. It was a lot of fun to have worked on that. And all through the 1980s, the 90s, and into the 2000s, I continued to work on sustainable design. Sometimes my clients knew what I was doing. For example, that image on the top left, that's the daylight model that I worked on at my firm for DIA's main terminal. That's what DA was gonna look like before the last minute change to the tent roof. Uh, but some of the time in, in those decades, we were doing sustainability in a bit of a stealth mode. That's what I used to call it. Sometimes sustainability was so out of fashion, we had to almost do it in secret within our firm. So it, it, it's been an up and down ride in sustainable design. Um, Mike mentioned a few of the other activities. I, I believe architects need to be advocates. It's not good enough to just to be doing great work. We've got to get out there and be willing to engage. So. I've had that commitment through most of my career. I just wanted to share one of the things I really enjoyed was the three years that um, we, we took on the high performance building program for the governor's energy office. We were the consultant who essentially ran that. And what was great about it is it took me all over the state talking to clients, contractors, building owners, other architects, and, and getting a much better understanding of the range of challenges they all had trying to implement better and more sustainable design. And, and I'm still proud to say that the 42 projects that we touched that were state funded, uh, because of our interventions through the program, we were able to save $75 million in lifetime utility bills for the taxpayers of Colorado. So you can make a difference as an architect when you get involved. So I'd encourage you to think about that. We've heard a lot about the 2030 uh, challenge today. I'm a huge advocate and fan of, of 2030 and all that Ed Mesri has done to bring this about. Uh, the little red dots show you where we are at Cunningham Group. Uh, so just this year, we finally hit a 50% reduction, not where we want to be, of course, but making steady progress. And we are developing an aggressive plan to catch up uh, by the year 2025 to the 90% target that will be in place at that time. It's a lot of work, um, but it's something that I find really helps drive uh, a process in our practice. So I'm really glad that we have the 2030 challenge around to use as a motivator. In fact, one of the things I've learned about 2030 is to make it really impactful. I've started generating quarterly reports that are personalized for every project manager and every principal in our firm. They get these reports, you're seeing an example here, each dot represents the size of a particular project. The y-axis shows how it's doing on lighting power reduction. The x-axis shows how it's doing on energy use reduction. And ideally, all the circles would be in this top right quadrant. So you can see in this particular report, none of this principal's projects were quite meeting that report. And we use this to drive change uh, in a timely manner, because what we've learned is if you just get a yearly report, it's not really going to make much of a difference in most people's practice. All right, so I'm going to share with you quickly a few example projects just to give you a feeling for the range of sustainability approaches that are in our firm. I'm sure they, this range exists in many other firms. Uh, our largest office happens to be in Minneapolis on the banks of the Mississippi River in a hundred year old warehouse building. And we recently completely gutted and renovated this to achieve the well building rating system. Because what we're seeing is that with sustainability, it's no longer enough just to focus on energy and water and materials. We have to increase the emphasis on providing spaces that provide 
healthy, productive environments for human beings who use those. So, so taking our own building through well was a great learning experience to make that happen for us. And speaking of well-being and now biophilia, uh, we have a very active healthcare group. And uh, this is a, a wonderful thing that they were able to bring about because it's the first of its kind that I know of anywhere in the country. This is a uh, linear accelerator imaging room. Uh, incredible amounts of energy uh, are being developed in this, in this room. Normally a room like this is lined with three feet of concrete. So the idea that a room like this would actually have a view out is unheard of. And yet our brilliant staff, I, I can't take credit for this in any way, they figured out a way to have a light well with light from above, a beautiful stone veneer background and live plants out there. Can you imagine how much better this is for a patient to, to be in this room in a stressful situation having that particular view? So biophilia is something we're thinking more and more about in our projects. Um, speaking of our, our HEAL group, that's what we call our healthcare folks. Uh, we just finished the world's largest emergency hospital in Qatar. And one of the interesting things about this was dealing with a completely different certification program used in the Middle East. It's called GSAS. And I just wanted users to make a point about certifications. Uh, you heard earlier, there are just too many of them probably. Uh, we try to do them ourselves. We were getting pretty good at doing LEED, CHIPS, well, LBC, and others. Um, but to us, the, the certification is never the end goal. It's a means to an end, that end being a better, healthier building. Uh, here's another fun project I wanted to share with you. Uh, we've been working with the Epic Corporation in Rona, Wisconsin for 25 years. They have a 10,000 person campus. And um, most of the time that campus runs at a zero energy state. And it does so because we have a combination of the country's largest privately held green roof, the largest geo exchange field, and the largest PV array all on the same property. And one of the things I really love is our designers figured out a way to combine all of those resources together. So the PV field is elevated above an active farm and below that active farmland is a geo exchange. And uh, these panels are high enough that you can drive a full size John Deere tractor underneath to maintain the farm. So it's a really fun example of how to get multiple uses out of one piece of ground. Uh, we really like working on multifamily projects. We do them all across the country. And we believe that these projects are inherently sustainable because they utilize existing infrastructure and they use resources, materials, and energy so much more efficiently than any form of single family housing possibly could. Um, sustainability just doesn't apply at the scale of individual buildings. It applies at the scale of planning and cities. Uh, this is a, a project we're working on right now. It's in the early stages. It's a conversion of an abandoned golf course into a mixed use community. And uh, we were asked by St. Paul, our client in this case, to develop a zero carbon community, including all inputs of transportation, utilities, and so on. So uh, we've got this really amazing model that's constantly recalculating energy carbon and all the water that goes into this project. Really excited to see that one come about. Wanted to share with you uh, a little more in depth example of a project. This is one that I was fortunate to be directly involved with. It's the Metal Arc School up in Boulder Valley. It's lead gold and it's uh, net zero energy ready. But the interesting thing is we decided to pursue a totally different strategy here, making natural ventilation the primary HVAC approach, not in a many, but actually the main strategy for providing fresh air into the building. And that let us do two things that are normally contradictory. It let us have incredible energy efficiency and much better air quality because often those things don't go together, they're often actually opposed to each other. So here you can actually see, we've been tracking this building in the years it's been open. Um, we try to get um, our indoor air quality, and we use CO2 as a proxy for indoor air quality. We try to get it as close to 800 or below as we can. Many buildings, it floats up to 1,000, 1,500, even 2,000. So you can see from this chart, this building is actually achieving 800 parts per million the majority of the time. If you had to pick one school in Colorado to send your kids back to in the COVID area, it's this building. So we're really excited about the results we're getting here. Uh, one last uh, project, then I'll be wrapping things up. This is our Sierra Grande PK-12 school. It's one of the best uh, funded projects. It's down in Southern Colorado in the San Luis Valley. And it's our first 
fully net zero energy building. We have others that are net zero ready or are net zero on an occasional basis, but this one is fully net zero ready. And it's an all electric building in a really cold climate. So this is really going a long way toward achieving um, the, the goals of the climate imperative by avoiding all fossil fuel use on the property. Uh, we're really getting serious about embodied carbon. We know that's an emerging issue that we've got to take more seriously as architects. Uh, we started studying this just a few years ago when the first project we took through a rigorous analysis of embodied carbon was this Aspen uh, Community School in Woody Creek, Colorado, completed four years ago. And uh, we did a full embodied carbon analysis on this. And you know the results are pretty good. You can see there, 447,000 kilograms of CO2 equivalent. Uh, that's actually a pretty low number uh, for an education facility. And they, the lesson here was that uh, we achieved that because we used a mostly wood structure in place of metal. But look how big concrete is. So concrete is an area where we are starting to focus a lot more attention here in Colorado. Uh, the last piece I wanted to share with you is our own operational carbon footprint story. Uh, we believe it's not good enough as architects to, to simply design uh, great and sustainable buildings. We have to set an example for our clients, show them it can be done, and finally we have to walk the talk. So last year we analyzed top to bottom our entire carbon footprint, uh, learned that we are right at 5.7 uh, tons uh, per employee per year, which as it turns out is about average for a large design firm that has multiple offices. Of course this year with COVID we're, we're, we're less than a half of that, uh, but we are taking steps to offset our entire carbon footprint and we'll be able to say by the beginning of 2022 that as an operation, as a corporation, we are net zero energy. So with that, I think I'm going to conclude and uh, turn it over to questions. Thanks very much. Thanks, Paul. Um, I've seen this presentation or some version of it a few times now, so it never gets old. It, it gets more inspiring every time. And just so you guys know, I mean, this is, of course, part of the organizational imperative, right, is to bring our own level of expertise up as members uh, in this area. But it's, we can't just talk to ourselves. So Paul's sort of our closer that comes out of the bullpen. Um, he's spoken uh, at a green schools conference. Uh, he's testified before the legislature. He's given a session um, to the A3LC, which is architects, engineers, and contractors, um, and uh, doing legislative town halls. So um, we have an external obligation as well to spread this message of how architects can be part of uh, solving the climate challenge uh, for, for clients and, and society as well. So. Um, I'm going to ask now if the other panelists will bring up their videos as well, and we'll get to the questions. We've had a few come in, um, and if you have a question you want to type in, now's the time to do it. We'll get them started. Um, and I'm going to ask our, our presenters to um, sort of self-select amongst the group here who wants to answer these questions. Um, it's not always going to be apparent from the questions being asked where they'll say, for example, Paul, can you tell us? Or, or Melissa, I want to know more about. So um, we'll let you guys jump in for whoever wants to answer them as you see fit. All right, we'll start with a question here from Julian Linehan. Actually, there's two, so we'll do them in order. So the first is, and, and of course, this is, this is the big one, right? How do we persuade owners to value sustainability, um, which is, lead and above, not as um, just getting a basic lead certification. Um, setting and achieving embodied carbon targets, for example. Well, I'll start and it, it's a fundamental challenge and uh, a huge issue for all of us designers. We, we all wish we had clients, like one that I shared with you, Boulder Valley Public Schools that came to us with high aspirations and those are fun projects and they almost always go really well. But the reality for most of us is that the majority of the time we have to undertake an educational process with our own clients. Mm -hmm. So we have built into our process, into our initial meetings with clients, some education around not all of these issues, it could be overwhelming, but we try to, for example, use the code top 10 framework and pick two or three of those issues and try to get them in front of the client help them understand why they might be relevant and, and especially try to connect them to what we perceive to be that client's values. 
So to us, it's always a process, or almost always, a process of doing some education. You don't always get as far as you hope to, but if you don't try, you're guaranteed you won't progress. So uh, it, it's, it's a vexing problem. I don't have all the answers, but that's, that's what we do. Any other success stories that, that folks want to share? I would agree with what Paul is saying that, um, you know, educating ourselves first um, and then overcoming the um, kind of inertia of the way things are uh, is one of the biggest challenges. I think there's a lot of um, uh, understanding from the general construction world that, you know, anything sustainability wise is crazy, uh, increases the cost. And so um, formulating the, uh, the conversation around long term operational costs, I think, is one way that almost always uh, wins the day in terms of saying, all right, you know, if you're only going to do this for a year and sell it, then this may not be the right project. But, you know, if you're a school or a government agency um, where, you know, they're looking at long term hold, the numbers always uh, play out uh, as a return on investment uh, to do things more thoughtfully. Well, a second question from Julian asks, can design firms, uh, architects and engineers, push to have a qualifications-based selection criteria based on their sustainability and embodied carbon experience? And I, I guess I take this two ways. One would be maybe there's a policy objective here where we look to change how, how public entities um, use QBS, but uh, I know as prime consultants, you hire a lot of firms as well. So maybe there's something that we can do that that's within our own control about doing that. Yeah, well, one of the things we do, we're, we're pretty aggressive in how we pre-qualify our engineering consultants. So uh, for example, on the structural engineering side, we are requiring our structural engineers to provide to us embodied carbon model within their base services. So uh, I've had some engineers come back to me and say, I don't even know how to do that yet. So we are uh, working with some of our structural engineers uh, to help un them understand what, what kind of software they need to use and what's the output that we're looking for that we, that we can take advantage of as we're doing our work. So uh, that, that's one example where we are trying to pre-qualify our, our critical uh, colleagues and consultants in this process. And we do something similar with MEP. Has anybody seen this around the country with um, any submittal requirements? You, you know, we're, we're not seeing very aggressive criteria for sustainability in RFPs, but I can say in the last three months, I am seeing far more sustainability comment, uh, content in RFPs than I ever have. So it, it's not consistent. It's wildly variable in terms of what one client's looking for versus another, but but I would say it's very safe to say that that clients on average are much more aware of the issues and are starting to ask for it. So it, it is changing, but it'd be nice if we were more standard and maybe that's something we could do with that. So oh, question from, two questions from Margarita Gonzalez um, and maybe Melissa or April can take this one. What do you think is the biggest challenge to implement the AI sustainable agenda? What is the biggest challenge to implementing the sustainability agenda? Um, I think for some architects, it's knowledge. Um, I think that not all of our members are um, as well versed as some of the people on this call on um, some of the easier reaches within sustainability. I think that there's a little bit of a reputation that it's kind of an all or nothing, which is one of the things we're trying to get away from with, um, away from with the, the framework. Um, and I think that the framework also to some of the other questions around conversations with clients, you know, the way the framework kind of frames some of the questions, it leads you to that net zero answer in a way that the client is never going to say that that is not a priority. So if you kind of ask these questions in a much more holistic way, the answer still is this wonderful, sustainable, net zero resilient project. And, and a client isn't going to say, well, I don't want a healthy building or I, I want a building that's gonna fall down in a, in a hurricane. And if you start 
kind of approaching some of these questions from that a different place rather than are you going to put in a little extra time and money to reach net zero, then they're, they're going to say no. But if you ask, you know, are you, I, I can't actually think of one of the questions off the top of my head, but the way the questions are phrased, it gets you to the same place, but in a more holistic kind of narrative path rather than um, a metric based path. And regarding um, a firm that has a sustainability action plan, you know, that's, that's one of those milestones in joining this, the 2030 commitment. And even if you aren't yet ready to join the 2030 commitment, it's a good thing to do, right? Um, should the a firm sustainability plan include some sort of commitment to increase diversity or equity? Definitely. Um, you know, I think that within AIA, we're addressing equity and um, within the framework with equitable communities, but there's also the um, the equity guides. So the our diversity and inclusion um, team has created this incredibly substantial um, equity guides. Oh, I think it's like nine chapters. There are 300 pages where it really outline how to bring equity into your firm culture. Um, and it, it's beyond just racial equity, but it's talking about how do you mentor, how do you um, foster good leadership within your firm, trying to make sure you bring everybody up. So whether it be women or minorities or people with disabilities or just everyone and how you can treat them all equally. It, it's a really, it's a dense resource, but it is amazing and it covers everything. So I highly recommend um, the equity guides in in integrating that into your firm culture. Uh, there will be an executive summary coming up, so uh, that might help you uh, navigate um, the, the fastest path to the information you're looking for, because um, it's not the kind of thing you're going to sit down and read from cover to cover, because it's, like I said, it's dense, but incredibly um, valuable and resourceful. So any everyone should uh, look at that. April, if you could, can you grab the link to that and put that in my box? I, everyone should take a look. I did, but yes, I did just drop that link into the box. So if anybody's looking to explore that, we've got it right there. Yeah, you know, for us, I would say equity social justice has been an ongoing parallel and related effort, but I, I couldn't really say it's part of our, our climate uh, sustainability action plan, uh, but it's been happening more or less in the same time frame, And there is definitely a lot of overlap and we're keenly aware of the issues around uh, climate justice as we do that. So, so just as an FYI, a resource that we are currently working on right now is um, an intersection project on the intersection of climate action, um, the pandemic, and uh, social justice. And so hopefully by the end of the year, early next year, we are going to have a document that kind of talks about where those three topics sort of come in together and where they intersect and how you can kind of address them in firm and projects moving forward. Yeah, I heard somebody describe it as, you know, 2020 is sort of the pandemic turducken. There's a crisis within a crisis within a crisis. And you can't just pick one and say, let's deal with this and hope the other ones work out. So um, I want to thank Margarita for the plug here because in, in two weeks, on the 23rd, we're having a, a deep dive session just like this one on our other board imperative, which is justice, equity, diversity, and inclusiveness. So um, I know we didn't tell you to ask that question, but it's a good <laughs> excuse to mention this program that's coming up in the future. Um, question from Ignacio Correa Ortiz. The 2020 Climate Action Plan asks architects to have a role in sequestering carbon with calls to practice embodied carbon design. However, according to Bill McDonough, carbon is not the enemy. Um, so there's this carbon sequestration paradox um, Will future revisions of the AI Climate Action Plan consider a new language of carbon where terms living, durable, fugitive, and working carbon are included? Well, yes, <laughs> carbon is, is, is really a big challenge. And it's, I think, one of the main reasons for the huge push behind the use of timber as a substitute for concrete and steel in our buildings. And so in Denver alone, we've seen a large number of timber buildings start to come into place as well as significant changes in our code that allow that to happen. But another place that we're really looking at intensely is what's happening 
on site design and landscaping because landscaping can be a real difference maker in whether you're sequestering carbon or not. And so, for example, if you develop a site and have a lot of irrigated uh, bluegrass turf area, that bluegrass turf is actually a net carbon emitter. By the time you mow it, maintain it, fertilize it, and do everything else over the years, that's going to be emitting uh, carbon. If, on the other hand, you converted acres of that from turf grass to woody plants, shrubs and trees, and you can use conservative practices to maintain it, you can create a site that starts to absorb cap carbon uh, and a net basis after a few years. So to me, it's, it's the structure and the site design that we're looking at as the keys to sequestration. But, but, but Ignacio's question goes way deeper. He's, he's using uh, some language from McDonough that, that's pretty significant. I think it's, it's, a, it's a hard question. Because honestly, I just want to take one step back from that question for a second, just because, you know, that is such an intelligent question the way it's asked in that most of our membership don't even necessarily understand the correlation between energy consumption and carbon output. And so, you know, within the coat top 10, you know, even the questions where we've started asking about the overall carbon footprint of a building, you know, most people answered that question wrong last year. So those are the people who are submitting for Code Top 10, answered the question on how much carbon they're building to, wrong. So, you know, we have a lot of education that we need to do around carbon as a whole for our profession um, before we kind of start getting into some of those um, nuances um, of the word and, and how it works. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Bob. Brad. No, I, you're, you're spot on um, that the carbon is sort of the universal currency. And so when you try and distill everything down to one thing, um, it, it loses uh, the important subtleties that are brought up in the question um, and that language. I mean, you know, I think if people can, and, even grasp the concept of carbon and how that contributes to greenhouse gases and what that does to the climate that that's a small breakthrough, but there's definitely levels to it. Um, that you know would certainly um, improve how we can address different issues if people are more uh, conversant in those different um, terms and factors of carbon. I I think that's true. And, and I think we get into that a lot when we talk about the embodied carbon in existing buildings, which is something that we talk about a lot at AIA, the value of existing buildings and not building new buildings um, and renovating the ones we have. But you dig, again, you get into that carbon terminology and that you're like, okay, well, all of the carbon was already emitted to create this building. So in that way, originally the carbon was still negative is that it was put out in the atmosphere, but, but it's already been spent. So on that aspect is the positive in that you don't need to go and spend more carbon in, in that currency um, state. So another question here, um, this is kind of a touchy one. Um, so have at it, who wants to take it? Um, from Drew Allen who asks, is AIA doing anything to hold its members and firms accountable for sustainability? And I think this goes beyond the code of ethics updates. Um, he says, it seems that many of these programs are done on a volunteer basis and asking people to buy in, but what are we doing as an organization to push people towards aggressive sustainability standards as part of their membership with AIA? So is, is there something like a, a Hippocratic Oath um, equivalent that, that we might want to do where it's, it's not just something we're asking you to try to maybe do if you have time, um, but it's an expectation. And I know years ago we had the, um, the four hours of uh, CES on an ongoing basis every year for that. And that kind of went away as we built it more into HSW um, coursework. But is, is there any, conversation happening about that as a baseline rather than a, than a plus? I think the required education is something that is coming back as a question, whether or not that is something that all AI members should have to do. Um, I have had people refer to the Framework for Design Excellence as a AI version of a Hippocratic Oath in that um, it should be general standard of practice. It should be a baseline. It is good design. It is not it is not the net zero project. It might lead you to a net zero project, but everyone should not do less than what is in the framework for design excellence. Um, but again, that, that doesn't have, um, 
there's no punishment. Uh, we aren't, I don't think that we've been pretty big on sticks at AIA. Um, I think code is one of the ways that we can raise the floor for all members and the entire profession and the building industry as a whole um, in that there, are, there is a minimum standard uh, that we would expect everyone to meet and, and get to, but that is not membership specific. I, I think that there is a huge stick out there that the AIA has inadvertently, perhaps for good, put into place, and that's the formal revisions to the Code of Ethics. If you dig into the current revisions to the Code of Ethics, and you put those in the hand of an attorney, that, and I've had plenty of discussions with this, with AI legal and our own in-house legal, there is plenty of possibility there. That, for example, if you fail to talk to your client about the climate consequences of certain design decisions, and later on that client is sued because his building pollutes, for example, you're gonna be in the line of fire. And so I do think that the change to the code of ethics we've created should be um, a signal to all member architects and firms, we've got to raise our game because we do now have a clear legal exposure if we don't do our job and, and, and fulfill those critical things that are now in the code of ethics. It essentially has changed the standard of care. And I think most of us just have the barest idea of what this is gonna mean. But just as we've seen fossil fuel companies get sued, we could be next in line. So get ready, we've gotta do better. So, so we've changed our standard process for how to have meetings with clients because of that code of ethics. Yeah, that's a good point, Paul. And you know, there's, there's a couple of ways the standard of care changes. It's either through the Practice Act or through um, something like the Code of Ethics or through codes. And so we've had yep. some great success with advocacy and, and pushing the envelope on codes and, and that might help us get there as well. And then I know you guys mentioned for national um, award submissions. That's a, that's a big carrot. You know, if you want to be called, if you want your project or your firm to be called one of the best designs, um, it should in fact be under these code top 10 principles, which are now the design excellence um, criteria. So um, it's tough for a voluntary membership organization that asks people and depends on them paying you dues to keep your operations uh, going to have a punitive model. Um, so we put the aspiration out there like, like Adam talked about at the top of the call of this is where we want to go as a profession and the leadership stake that we're planting in the ground and we hope as many of you come and, and join us in, in planting that stake as possible. So let's see, um, next question. I'm sorry, I'm bouncing over to the chat because some of them are in here too. So um, can anyone talk about uh, their awareness of the IECC code and the zero appendix? And um, so there's a couple things here. Who's, has anybody started designing to this code? And then I know there was an advocacy effort to make sure that this was um, a more viable option in the code development process. Yeah, it's true the IECC recently approved uh, the zero code as, as a valuable option. And so that was critical. So now any municipality um, has the ability to adopt the zero code as one compliance pathway. And so that could happen with the 2021 IECC. So that's definitely something that's coming. Here in Colorado, it's always tough with codes though because of course home rule. And so we don't have the ability to put into place a statewide code. So we're dependent on individual authorities having jurisdiction to make those decisions on which codes to adopt. So it'd be fun to talk about how do we push zero code in Colorado. That'd be an interesting challenge. That, that's what I know about it. And we've worked with it a little bit. I tried to push it through Denver, but they weren't quite ready to go there. Yeah, but they're they're making progress on a lot oh, of yeah. Den Denver's made great strides in its code, no doubt. Yeah, I'm I'm really excited about what they've done. Yeah, and you've got some you've got building energy disclosures in a variety of cities across the state. So there's um, it's a multi pronged approach with a lot of different strategies and and several several ways to get at this. Mm -hmm. uh, Sarah Broughton asked a question about, um, I think it was when you were talking, Paul, uh, based on the timestamp here, 
um, which which of the tools that you use are are pre-designed, you know, sort of when you're trying to incorporate in a goal that you want to be at and which of them are post-occupancy? Well, on most of our projects, we try to gather utility data. So we, we have an EUI understanding. We try to collect water data when we do the same thing. And then unfortunately, our, our in-depth POEs are still only occasional. You know, and the reality is clients aren't paying us to do post-occupancy evaluation. So it's a, it's a hard thing to find a way to fund or put in place a mechanism to get that to happen in our firms. I, I'm curious if, if any of you guys have been more successful trying to get uh, POEs to happen on a regular basis. So, so right now for us, unfortunately, it's mostly limited to energy and sometimes water. Thanks, Paul. Uh, and then, um, how is AI National incorporating expert organizations who specialize in these categories into the AI strategies? So the comment was, um, there's little reference to established organizations beyond the 2030 group. Um, so who else have you been working with or do you intend to continue to working with or, or are you wanting to establish a relationship with to help us um, along the way so we're not going it alone? Um, we have a lot of relationships um, at AI National, almost too many. Um, Architecture 2030 is one of the strong ones, but we also do a lot of work and support the Carbon Leadership Forum um, and are actively involved in those conversations. We work with another organization, uh, organization called um, the Climate Heritage Mobilization, which is talking about existing buildings um, and climate change. We are trying to get into um, COP26. We also do frequent work with um, APA, the um, Landscape Architecture Association. We do work with, um, oh, April, help me out. Who, uh, we have the entire Resilience Coalition, which includes, yeah, we, um, have, we have the NIBS, so the National yeah, Institute of Building Sciences. NIBS and FEMA. We also work with um, ASHRAE and a lot of the, the engineering um, organizations on the resilience and disaster assistance side, um, and then also uh, the ICC. And yeah. in practice, I we, still think uh, USGBC brings tremendous value. You know, we have a love-hate relationship with LEED and USGBC, but there's still a lot of tremendous resources there. And, and I love what the uh, Living Futures Institute does. So they're an organization I follow very closely. I attend their events. I think they're bringing a tremendous richness to the dialogue and, and a passion that was sort of lacking at USGBC. They're a great complement. So uh, to me, those two organizations for a practicing architect or firm are really impactful. On the staff side, we have a strong relationship with um, the International Living Future Institute and work together on a few projects, um, more so than USGBC at the moment. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you know, that comes and goes depending on leadership, but I get that. <laughs> and I know the Resilient Buildings Coalition was something that AIA took the lead on, you know, led the charge on gathering those groups together. It started with just a handful of, of our usual co-collaborators, but there's now dozens of signatories on that. So um, there's, it's an all hands on deck situation for sure. Um, so even though we talk a lot about uh, this AI program or that AI program or this training or this uh, standard, um, it, it's informed by a group effort and it's not just architects talking to ourselves. Yeah, and I would also say that um, we have a lot of partners in advocacy as well. Uh, most federal advocacy is not done just by AIA. We're usually a part of a coalition. Um, we don't often lead the coalition, so we find other building industry partners um, and we kind of move the entire building industry together rather than uh, AI trying to go solo on um, federal advocacy issues. So I wanna end with this question because I think it's, it's the big question that, that will drive our future. Um, and I'll ask anybody, um, in fact, everybody, if, if you can, to give your take on it. And it's from Michael Holtz who says, what is it going to take to get all, or at least the majority of Colorado, Colorado architects designing aggressive net zero carbon projects? Uh, 
Don't all jump in at once. <laughs> I don't think there's a single answer. I mean, I, I would say um, that um, it's a combination of carrots and sticks. And I think education is the first point. I mean, um, overcoming the, you know, perceived cost barriers and sort of ignorance about what um, what does have an impact and what doesn't. Um, and I think, um, you know, we should be much further along than we are today. I, you know, I share Michael's frustration, um, but, um, you know, we have to go from where we are. And, uh, like, you know, I appreciate the AIA was, uh, has a hard time with the sticks, um, but, you know, legislatively and or um, professionally, there's got to be some um, combination. Well, we'd love to see the state of Colorado step up and make all of its new buildings net zero energy and set the example. And you know, we, we've had some discussions around that in our uh, government affairs committee. So uh, that would, that would, I think a couple of key moves like that could make a difference. I think both of those are accurate. I think education and architects on how to design buildings that can be more readily net zero, uh, either net zero ready or, but I, but I also think that um, as a, and this is me just putting this is not my AI hat, this is my architect hat. Um, I think that we need more aggressive legislation on whether it be um, cap and trade or kind of, I think we need more sticks in, uh, in what happens if we design buildings that um, are more carbon intensive. And um, I think that we kind of need to be penalized from that, on that um, uh, from a national or state level. Uh, I think that that's, some people will only um, respond to um, money, uh, a monetary aspect to it, and they have to get fined, or, or it, it's not, it's not enough. Other than that, but yeah. April or Adam, anything to add? Yeah, well, you know, I think as AI Colorado, I think you know, making a stand right now and saying this is important to us as an organization, I think is one step in the right direction. And so hopefully we can build on this conversation that we've had today. And like everyone said, you know, educate and just talk about it and make sure people understand that there's tools and resources out there um, for them to educate their clients and to um, make things happen in the right direction. So. Yeah, Brad took my heading. My whole section on the PowerPoint was education and resources. So um, people helping, you know, people accessing all of our information. Um, we have a whole guide coming out soon. That's all about how you talk to your clients about renewable energy and integrating it into the project. And if you can't do it, then how do you get your projects ready? So um, on our end, it's working to make more of those, you know, entry level accessible resources that can get those people who maybe um, won't respond to a stick or we don't have a stick um, to beat them with, then maybe this is how we get them there. Well, I, I want to thank everybody for your participation today. It, it is a, it's a big issue and it's an important issue. And so I think what, what we want you to hear is that um, it would be a problem if we didn't recognize it as a top priority or we didn't have resources or programs or educational tools or an advocacy agenda, um, any carrots or sticks, in our toolkit to use, but we do have a lot of those at our disposal and we have said this is one of the top priorities for the organization from national to state to local. Uh, and we have some things that practitioners can use wherever they are on that, on that continuum of, of commitment or, or qualifications or skill sets or, or you name it, and wherever their owners and, and clients are. So, it's finding wherever you are on that spectrum and moving it forward. The, the phrase that I really liked is propelling the bell, you know, that we can't expect everybody to be at the bleeding edge of this um, because not every client is there, not every practitioner is there, not every um, architecture school that trains is, is talking about this stuff. So wherever we are, let's help to move it forward and, and advance the ball. And so, I think that's where we're going. And um, hopefully we look back after this is um, completed as a board imperative and can say, uh, you're never gonna say mission accomplished, right? But you can say we made a difference. So these are the people that are helping to make a difference and we know there's a lot more on the call today and around the state. So we just invite you to join us on this journey 
and keep us moving forward. Um, thanks to all you, you for participating and helping to illuminate this conversation. And uh, we've got uh, the next two weeks, we've got some sessions lined up. So um, we hope to see you back here Wednesday at noon um, as we continue our virtual connect series. And thanks for joining us today. Take care, everybody.